What I would like to see our legislative delegation from Fayette County do is continue to find ways, look for ways to fund the existing QBE formula that the state has for the, to fund their portion of our school system. I'm sure you've heard of the amended formula adjustment and the austerity cuts and the Quality Basic Education Act funding formula since 2003. The state has, and I understand that the state has revenue shortfalls as well, but the, um, there have been cuts to that formula that are just deducted from our formula earnings. And since from 2003 to 2012, those have totaled over $75 million in cuts just to Fayette County. Last year, it was uh, right around $15 million. So with cuts like that coming from the state that are very difficult to predict and very difficult to plan around, that is what has gotten us in the bind that we're in locally. Sure, there were things that we could have cut differently sooner or whatever, but if it weren't for the cuts coming from the state funding formula, we wouldn't be in nearly as dire a situation with, as we are now. And what I would really beg you to do is never support anything that is going to divert funding from our public schools to some other system until the QBE funding is restored. Great. Mary Kay, anything to add? Yes, I am so glad you asked that question because earlier today I was talking with Lynn Westmoreland and I, I told him, I want you to go to Washington, I want you to repeal No Child Left Behind, and then I want you to end Race to the Top. <laughs> and he, I don't think he's going to be able to do those things, but you, on the other hand, are in a position where you, where you can, for our state, um, not take the race top funding. Why? Because it's only $80 a student, but for that $80 we're getting in race to the top funding per student, we are having to change our entire curriculum. We are having to redo all of, all of our assessments, and those assessments are not coming from our state. Those assessments are coming from Washington, D.C., and I don't think, we, I don't think there are answers in Washington, D.C. I think our answers are right here. So I would say take that race to the top, and actually, Fayette County has done well in not, not being a pilot uh, county for the race to the top uh, um, evaluation system. But it's coming. And I see it in all the other counties because I go out and I, I observe teachers in all the other counties. It will cripple us. It's not worth $80 a student to have that. So please, send the, we'll stand with Texas. We'll stand with Vermont. Send the money back. All right, thank you. Okay, as part of the National Urban Alliance, I worked with the National Urban Alliance for uh, five years uh, with Dr. Eric Cooper. That is so important about meeting the needs of our, of our students in terms of our advanced students. So I would advocate using the Renzulli model of learning where we have advanced uh, classes, we have advanced programs for students, not just the ones that qualify for gifted, and once they're gifted, they're gifted in everything, but specific programs, well, maybe you have a, an, an aptitude in math, maybe you have an aptitude in, in a language or writing. We need to challenge those students because if we're just gonna go with the race to the top money and, and do whatever the federal government tells us to do, then we're not gonna be challenging our students at their individual level. So I, I would support the expansion of advanced uh, education uh, including expanding advanced placement courses, expanding gifted education. There are more kids out there that we can get into those gifted programs in their specific subject areas. Okay, thank you. Terry, anything? Your first question was why hire me, and I would have to go back to the experience and um, what I bring, what I take out of the county in terms of being an ambassador for the county around the state and the work that I do at the state level with the Georgia School Boards Association. But, and with regard to your specific question about enrichment, that is one of the issues that I think we all recognize. Um, there's more that we could do for the advanced students. And it comes back to not a lack of willingness or a lack of desire or a lack of understanding the problem, but it comes down, again, to funding and what kind of programs you can offer because I too have 
children who um, qualified for enrichment programs. And what I found when I started looking at school system budgeting that was unacceptable to me is oftentimes to offer those children what we think they should have, some other child has to make some sort of sacrifice for it. And that's not right. If, if the if extra enrichment classes for a gifted child mean larger class sizes for a non-gifted child, if we're having to make other children make sacrifices to those programs, that's something that I really can't um, in good conscience support. If there is additional funding for the enrichment program, uh, there's, there's really no limit to what I would like to see them be able to do. One example is the College and Career Academy, which is not just a career academy and a job training program, but an opportunity for the faster, brighter students to be able to do things, uh, more things at the college level and take more advanced courses at that level. That doesn't really answer your question with regard to the whole spectrum of um, first, second grade through 12th grade for gifted, but yes, I, I agree that we need to offer them more. All right, thank you. Could, How, could wait, I follow, we'll get some other questions. Up? No, we want to continue to, to, okay. to go on with the next question. Good to see you again. Were you at the meeting last night? I thought you were. Um, I have supported the superintendent's recommendation to uh, look at consolidating some schools because we do save some overhead costs by doing that in, in terms of administration. It, it's my opinion that it's a drop in the bucket to the overall a budget shortfall that we're facing. It's not going to solve the problem. It's one tiny piece of the puzzle. I think it should be done in a manner that is um, least disruptive. I don't think students should be moved for the sake of balancing enrollment between two schools or anything like that. I think it should be done if we, if we close schools and consolidate. I think, especially at the middle school level, which I assume that's what you're talking about because that's um, what we were talking about last night. Um, obviously, I think the feeder patterns for the high schools and the middle schools, it, ma it makes good sense to align those as much as possible so that you don't create feeder orphans from the middle school to the high school level if we close a middle school. But I, I, don't, I don't support moving anybody. You don't have to move to make that happen. Did that answer your question? All right, Mary Kay? Under the current system, parents choose to buy a house in a community where they want their children to attend school. There is an unwritten assumption between the parents and the school board that this is the case. If I am elected, I will honor these choices. Many of those choices came with a 30-year mortgage. With each redistricting, we lose more students. Parents don't want the educational fate of their children to be decided by five people who don't get along. There is a cost to instability, and Fayette County has been paying that cost. If I take office in January, the instability will come to an end, and we will work together to make sure that these levels of instability and uncertainty are a thing of the past. I believe that one person who has decided to honor the choices parents make keep the best interest of the taxpayers in mind and honor our great teachers can make a difference. I will treat you the way I would want to be treated. Very good, thank you. Let's get a question from this side of the room again. I would say, uh, let's look at our mission. Our mission, if I'm elected by the Fayette County voters, would be to serve the people of Fayette County, the students of Fayette County who are, live in Fayette County. And that's what I will do to the best of my ability. Thank you. Terry? I don't disagree with what she said. And up until last year, I would have I've consistently opposed the idea of allowing um, out-of-county students in, um, on a tuition basis because I felt like it would be too difficult to handle administratively. In the meantime, though, I have talked to uh, school board members from around the state from systems that where they do allow it and had some of my questions answered and some of my concerns relieved by that. I don't think we should do it unless we, we can do it in a way that actually 
creates a positive cash flow, generates revenue, and does not create an additional burden on our existing students or teachers. It absolutely shouldn't be allowed to overcrowd classrooms. I think it's something that's worth exploring at this point because of our declining enrollment and because there's so much emotion around the idea of consolidating and closing schools and redistricting students. It seems like to me that it's worth exploring the possibility of, that's a lot of qualifications and I know, but I just want to say that I would, I would not support it in every form. Uh, we would have to be very, very careful how we implemented it. But if we could backfill some of these um, under capacity classrooms with students in a way that makes it more affordable for us to hire more teachers and generate some revenue, I see that as a way to minimize this idea of having to close schools and redistrict students. And we would completely control um, if a student came into the system that wasn't an asset to the system, then we, they wouldn't be readmitted in the future is the way I would see that working if, if we did it. Okay, thank you. We had another question right here near the front. Mary Kay? Uh, I, it goes back to meeting the needs of our students, and I believe that what we need to do is honor those parents' choices, those parents' decisions, and do a survey and find out what the parents and the students want, what they're interested in, and then guide our, our um, course offerings according to that. Now, I know the business community has needs, and I would, I would say that those needs would be secondary to the the choices parents make, and I would also consider those needs, but not before the choices that the parents make. Why are y'all picking on Mary Kay? Okay, ahead, Mary I will Kay. take a stand. I'm going to take a stand, and I thought I just did. My stand is this. If you bought a house in Fayette County, and your, your idea was to go to a certain school, we need to honor that idea. That is where I stand. Thank you. Terry, would you like to also say anything regarding that? I don't really know what to add other than um, there's been a, a great deal of political pressure recently around the concept of capacity and enrollment. And the citizens have said to us that they feel as though we need to do something to address the fact that there's a discrepancy between our capacity and our enrollment. And the only way I can see to do that and uh, reduce some of that administrative overhead is to um, consolidate schools. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I will be very happy if we don't do it. But the reason um, I think the, direct, the questions are often directed to Mary Kay is I have a voting record. Um, I'm already on record as having said I would support the superintendent's recommendation as it stood. And so to... Um, waffle and say that I'm against school closings would be well, false and disingenuous. So I have to um, be consistent with what I've said, which was that especially at the middle school level where there is um, significant excess capacity, I can see that there would be some budget savings by doing what the superintendent had recommended. Thank you. Let's get another question from this side of the room. Terry? Ooh, um, budget saving options that I right? support. I'll, I'll tell you that we've been, since our first austerity cuts, we've all, every year, I've, let me back up a little bit. Every year that I've been on the board, every report from a financial director that I've ever heard, including I've just recognized Jim Stevens sitting in the, um, the audience, was that it's going to be a lean budget year. We're not going to have the money we've had in the past. We're going to have to cut. We're going to have to tighten our belts. And that's what 
And, and I sort of got a, maybe a little bit jaded with these finance directors, the sky is always falling. And then in 2008, the sky fell. And we had to get really, really <coughs> serious about um, budget cuts. And we spent an enormous amount of time listing and prioritizing the things that Fayette County offers that we fund primarily locally and what we could stand to lose and where we could um, tighten up, what we could eliminate. And we managed so far up until this year really to protect the things that we um, most wanted to protect. But there are some things that I don't see how, barring some um, influx of money from the state, back to the QBE funding formula that we're going to be able to continue to protect things like first grade parapros. We're practically the last um, county in the state that is, is still funding those. I have a list because this is a long list and I have to put on my glasses so I can see it. Um, we had um, separated high school and middle school bus routes for a long, uh, uh, quite a few years back for safety of students and, and we don't like the idea of combining those, but there would be some money uh, possibly saved there. Um, we've already talked about consolidating. We've um, over, some outsourcing. We're not uh, very excited about that. We're looking at generating revenue through tuition students. Um, there's been a suggestion that we try to raise the millage cap. I wouldn't be very optimistic that the voters would approve that, but that would be one thing we could do, and they are looking in every department for ways to save money all, all the time. Mary Kay? Well, Thank you, I Terry. speak and I think numbers. So when you look at school operating costs of $1.10 per square foot, and you look at the cost of operating, the non-personnel cost of operating Fayette Middle is $112,500 uh, $112, because we would still have to pay if we shut it down 25%. Brooks is 50,250. Fayette Intermediate is 54,750. Hood Avenue is 60,750. Tyrone is 49,500. That brings us to a total, if we close all of those schools, actual non personnel cost savings are 327,750. That is not worth it. I will not do that. <laughs> what will I do? I would get the personnel in line with the number of students we have at the schools, because right now it's not, it's not done that way. We need to go back and look at SACS. We need to go back and look at what the funding levels dictate, and we need to go by that. All right, thank you, Mary Kay. Let's get another question from this side of the room. Oh, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> uh, that's my husband. We love our children. Our daughter, Christina, is um, a second year student at Georgia Tech where she's an RA living on campus and she's a graduate of Whitewater High School. She was on the state championship volleyball team. We're so proud of her. She served the ball. Um, my son, our son Aldo is a senior at Whitewater High School. He videotapes the football games and he's, he's really uh, great at math. Um, our daughter Mariana, she is um, a freshman in high school and she's more verbal. She likes to write stories, and, and uh, she goes to Whitewater High School. And our youngest daughter, our baby, Emily, she is uh, in sixth grade at Whitewater Middle School, and she's just a joy. Uh, we love all our kids. So thank you for um, asking about them. I, I don't usually bring them to any of these things because I don't want them to misinterpret anything or anyone to um, say anything mean about them. So thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Mary Kay. Terry? Did you want to talk about your... Um, I, I'm just, I can say briefly that my oldest daughter, Haley, graduated from UGA this past year. My daughter, Emily, is a student at... Uh, yeah, woof, everybody always wants to do that. Um, my daughter, Emily, is a student at, at Kennesaw State University. She's studying to be a teacher. She wants to um, teach special ed. And my son, James, who is also a senior at Whitewater High School and I think has some classes with your son... Um, is excited to graduate, wants to be a doctor, we'll see. Also looking at UGA, he's just finished his Eagle Scout project, and we're obviously proud of all three of them and just, you know, trying to get them grown up in one piece.
That's a good question, and thank you for asking for a clarification. I don't see those. My, the context of the question about enrichment was different and had to do with class sizes and staffing and the expenses that go into um, staffing those enrichment programs and keeping those, building those in a bigger way. I don't think that students should have to change if they change schools, they should lose those opportunities but I, that they have in other schools. I think those opportunities should be available to them in all the schools. I think that the opportunities that are available to a student at McIntosh should also be available to a student at Sandy Creek. And if they aren't, it, you know, the, your example, um, I think that's something that has to be addressed as a part of this redistricting. I know I just talked about numbers being my language, but I don't have that exact figure in front of me. I'm sorry. I know it's gone up. I do have a nice chart. <laughs> I, I've been having, you know, this chart right here. So um, this, is, this is beautiful. Thank you <laughs> to the person who did this. Um, we have student enrollment right here, and then we have total costs right here. So that's, that would be total costs uh, by year starting in 2000 and going up to this last year. So in general terms, that's what it looks like. Um, here is uh, between 25 and 30,000. No? No. Oh, Can I'm sorry. I should read the chart before I show it to you. Can I address well, well, the well, answer? We're just I, about out of time. I'll allow sorry. you all to come up right after and, and this speak, is a great chart. speak to Mary Kay specifically. But go ahead, Terry. Um, the information that you're, that you're asking for is available on the Georgia Department of Education website. And uh, I actually have several spreadsheets and things where I have been tracking that data over a number of years. The per pupil the per, the per FTE expenditure has been in the neighborhood of $8,000, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. There are quite a few things that go into um, increasing costs per pupil. Some of it has to do with utility costs, um, fuel costs, transportation costs, those kinds of things that have been rising over time. Uh, let me qualify this by saying I don't think teacher salaries have risen as much as they should, but there has been an increase in teacher salary over time, and Fayette County enjoys an increasing what they call T&E factor, which is the training and experience factor, which is that our um, teachers stay for a long time and earn additional degrees, and so they go up on the pay scale over time and then the you know the occasional raises from the state benefit costs have increased dramatically especially for our classified personnel that's the non-certificated personnel uh, their employee benefits are funded um, in, a, in a separate system from the ones with the teacher and those costs have gone up significantly another thing that Fayette County did uh, many years ago, I don't remember if it was like 2002 or 2003, some of the people who were here then, we had not participated, our teachers had not participated in the Social Security program because of the teacher retirement system. I'm sorry, we joined, um, we allowed our employees to do that at their request. We started participating in Social Security. And that started out as something that cost us, um, whichever year we started it, about $3 million that year. But that cost has escalated to the tune of over $8 million a year now. And so there are a, a variety of factors, some within our control, some outside our control, that have uh, made those costs go up. All right, thank you very much. We don't have any time for any more questions, but I'm sure our candidates are going to stay here. Uh, and, and we'll be more than happy to talk to any of you all who want to ask them specific questions. So, Virginia, go ahead. I want to thank everyone again for the outstanding job, these two great candidates, and what a great audience.
And also, Julius, thank you so much for, for moderating um, to both, both of our candidates and also to the audience. Um, thank you for being here. This is critically important. Um, thank you for being willing to serve. And thank you for your interest in the process. Um, we do stand adjourned. Um, I believe that both candidates will be here and available if you have specific questions and you're welcome to linger. Um, one note, I know there have been some handouts passed out. Um, just a point of clarification, um, I believe some, some folks have, have done that of their own um, from the chambers in. Certainly our, our overarching goal was to make this a, 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 a non-biased and non um, um, uh, advocacy position. So thank you again for being here and uh, we'll see you next time.